Uh, we're going to be talking to David Lester and Gene Smith, uh, known as Mecha Normal, but uh, also as uh, artists and authors. And uh, we're going to be talking to them about uh, a new graphic novel that David has, uh, which he's launching tonight at Mondragon. So we're on one of the print Arbiter Ring, and uh, a really fascinating book. So we're going we're to talk to them about that. And then Mecha Normal is going to play a little live in studio in our uh, new live band room, the second band to uh, break it in. Here we are, we're going to be talking to the listener. Now, this is essentially two stories, uh, one historic story and one sort of contemporary story, intermeshed in sort of the, how they weave together uh, about art, about politics. And uh, I'm, I'm curious that it just, it, it seems from reading the book and looking at your, your, your sort of selected bibliography that you did do a lot of studying of uh, Germany during the Second World War. Uh, Lip, uh, I think that's a good Lipa, Lipa, uh, and, and things that went on in, in, in actual fact, uh, in terms of how the, the corruption of truth and uh, the use of art and propaganda. Where did the idea for this novel start? Well, I was reading a book on the uh, on the on the rise of Hitler, and within it, the talked about the small election and how it uh, occurred just two weeks prior to Hitler being named Chancellor of Germany, which is the leader of Germany. And uh, it seemed like the election played a rather pivotal role in, in why he, at that point in time, at that point in his history, at that point in the Nazi Party's history, why he was selected to lead Germany. So he didn't win an election to lead Germany. He was appointed by the president. So the more I dug into this little little known state election in, in the smallest state in Germany called Lippa, about 90,000 people, mostly Lutheran farmers, the more I was convinced that it, it played a major role that has been lost to history because when we talk about Hitler and the Third Reich, it's just overwhelming concentration camps and the Second World War and the Holocaust, everything else seemed rather minor. So these important points of how did he get to be in a position to do what he did I mean, that I would say that's a rather significant uh, bit of history, which has never had a proper book done about it. Mm -hmm. And it's mentioned in all these other books, if at all. And sometimes it's not even mentioned. We can read a book about the rise of Hitler, and it's not even mentioned. So, but I, so I had to dig a lot to find out information and piece it together about this particular election and why it was, in my mind, very pivotal to him taking over Germany. Mm -hmm. Now, there's stuff to be with our fear. I imagine there was more material that you could read. Well, yeah, absolutely. And there's also a lot of uh, papers that people have written about the rise of Hitler. And so those, I didn't list everything. I, I didn't want to be overwhelming with, with it. And I just wanted to give a selection. Mm -hmm. So there was obviously a lot of other sources. And I also consulted the uh, state and city archives of the actual state that I'm talking about, which no longer exists. It was absorbed into a bigger state, but uh, I did consult with the archivist there. I did uh, uh, use their picture file and of uh, Hitler campaigning in this small state of Lippa. So it was uh, it was actually extraordinary to do the resort research, and uh, a lot was gained through through that. You know, I, I wanted to ask you about sort of the research process because it seems I mean like you have to prepare quite a bit before you put pen to paper. Whether creating an image or, or the words for the, for the book, um, how did you like? Did you sort of map it out? Like, okay, this is how I want to do things in terms of research. Did you have sort of the, the overarching story in mind, and then flesh it out by researching to find things to fill it, like infill it, or what was the, the process like for research? Well, I started with the core uh, elements of uh, of, the, of the research. The core. Uh, facts of the situation of the election, and then from there I kept digging to to uh, uh, fill it out, uh, so to speak, and find out if there's any personal stories uh, and any headlines, any newspaper clippings that would help with the story. And through that, I pieced together a story about a, mur uh, a reporter being murdered. Well, there wasn't really a reporter murdered, but the Nazis did carry out murders in that state, and I have that on record in terms of my own research. And and so and that so it's to to build the story that way and how to tell history in a way that is actually uh, engaging would be the would be the, the approach that I took. And then I also created a modern story that intercut with the story from nineteen thirty three. And each 
the score of each scene was built uh, like you would a film script almost. You know, you would build it into scenes, and from there, once I had the whole script, the whole book written, I then broke it down, each scene, into how I would present it visually and what, what research visually I needed to do as well. Mm-hmm. Because, uh, I mean, your, the, the contemporary story, the artist who leaves uh, Canada, goes to Europe, and, and, and meets up with the, the, the figures from the past, uh, does as part of a sort of artistic tour of Europe. And so you've got her visiting uh, different yeah, galleries and, and sites in Europe. And I'm curious, you know, like, specifically, like, okay, because you mentioned specific artists at each gallery, so, so obviously you had to kind of figure out, okay, which galleries is she going to visit? and be sort of very specific about what she would see there. Um, was it, uh, I'm, I'm curious about that, but that visual journey that she takes uh, in terms of seeing this art, is it to, I mean, because she's fleeing Canada in a sense, but uh, is it to kind of lose herself in art or to find herself in art? Well, I, I think it's a bit of both, but ultimately is to find yourself in art, in the work of others. Just as uh, I wanted the whole book to be how to find ourselves in history and how important the events of 1933, how relevant they are to 2011. You know, Hitler won this small state election by 39% of the vote. Uh, we see contemporary, in contemporary politics how, how governments can be formed on the basis of that kind of percentage where the majority of people did not vote for somebody, but yet they are... You know, they, they are in power, and that hasn't changed since 1933. You know, and the campaign techniques of Hitler are actually very similar to what we find now with, with modern day politicians. It's, uh, it's really resonant, and I mean, I, I wasn't sure if it was, I mean, just coincidence that it ended up with uh, the, the most recent federal election, or if you had that in mind. Even <laughs> because obviously, with the graphic novel, it takes quite a while to. Yes, yes. Well, it's, right. it's, yeah. it's not just slapping hours on a page, you've got to individually create all of the, all the frames of art. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that usually takes a lot longer than writing a yes. novel. And so I was curious in terms of whether it was just happy coincidence that we went through this, because reading the, uh, the Joseph Goebbels uh, pamphlet about uh, those damn Nazis, and he talks about uh, we know that the fate of peoples is determined by personalities, never by parliamentary majorities. Uh, it was kind of uh, struck that I'm like, oh my god, this is, uh, <laughs> this is what we're living through right now. Well, it's not to let the listeners know that they can take a look at the beautiful artwork that David has created if they want to take a look online at the listener graphic novel wordpress.com so you can uh, see what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah. Like, you know, it's such a great conversation about the history and the origin of the, of the story that David's created, but do have a look at his amazing drawings. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I do want to talk about the artwork later because obviously, I mean, one of the characters is an artist and part is central to, to the book. Uh, but just, you know, it was it's so striking that this reading that passage and just being like, oh, this is, this is now. It's, it's not just like 60 years ago. I know, that's the thing about it. It took me uh, over the process of seven years to make this book. Mm-hmm. So I had no idea how a recent Canadian federal election would turn out or, or other elections. Uh, you, c- you can't determine that other than you know when you start a project like this that there is a relevancy. That's why I did it in the first place. That's why I chose the story because I thought it was relevant to contemporary times and it had something to teach us. And lo and behold, it, it does in terms of how parliamentary democracy works and the flaws within it and the flaws with winner take all. And, the, and, uh, and I think we should question this and question leaders. And, 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 and it's really a cautionary tale. It's a reminder to all of us as citizens. Yeah, and I mean, it's, uh, it's interesting because uh, obviously if it's taken seven years to, the, to create, uh, you couldn't predict just how things would end up. I mean, obviously you're living through it as you're creating it, so maybe it filters in mm-hmm. and then sort of revisions get made within the, the process. Uh, but uh, uh, one of the passages I thought was quite interesting was uh, when uh, was, uh, your, your, your second character is talking with Pomas and she says, with her political art, I wonder, does it tell you what I, want, what I know or what I want you to know, or is it already telling you what you already know? And uh, I was curious in terms of the, that that idea. Well, that uh, political art, I mean, obviously, this book is in the sense of the political art. And did you have an answer that you're closing yourself within the context of the book? Well, that's part of what uh, the, the book is questioning that. 
and questioning the use of aesthetics with the scene of politics, and that's certainly what the most important part of Nazi ideology was aesthetics. And, uh, and actually, in fact, the person who came up with that piece was, was my partner, Gene Smith, and we, we have talked about that in a lecture that we gave and how art and music can change the world. And so her, her, that's actually her contribution. I don't know if you want to jump in here on that one. I'm making a video of the proceedings <laughs> here, concentrating on keeping everybody's head in the little in the the that I'm working with. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> well, you, uh, you did write some of the passages in, in the book. There's a sort of myth about art. Yes, the character in the book that I was working on at that time uh, jumped from my book to Dave's book. And again, it was it was more a thought on my part that, you know, it may come in handy at some point to have my character in Dave's book. And likewise, Louise, David's protagonist, is in my book helping out Celia deal with her online dating problems where the personal is political. So that was kind of a an act of foresight in, in our, you know, long 25 to 30 year history as friends and creative collaborators mm -hmm. to, to sort of think ahead and, and, and uh, have, them, have them meet in both books. So David's dealing with the political as personal, you're dealing with the personal as political, and he's sort of the, the, these two characters blend across the, the, it, the two. It is quite strange that uh, the work that we do, if it doesn't uh, appear to be hinged to each other at the point of creation, it often ends up that there are points of collision in what we're, we're working on. For instance, the song that we'll play second in our live set today is called Malachi, and it's about a political activist who took his own life as a, as a political act, and it was unfortunately not dealt with in the way that he had hoped it would be in that he wanted his death to be a warning to other people, and it simply didn't work out that way for him. So our writing a song about it intends to further his sort of failed message, but also, you know, lo and behold, there's an, another political activist that more or less is trying to do something and fails, and then I realize, well, that's what's happening in Dave's book with mm -hmm. Louise. So it's like, okay, we're, we're writing the same thing a few years apart. Thematically, just from our uh, probably our close collaboration and interests as, as we go along, and what we focus on in the world, having having known each other this long too. Yeah, that raises that an interesting question. You talk about the, the the political act that ultimately fails, and that's kind of what opens the book. And you talked about you know structuring this like a, a movie in terms of blocking it out and, and, and mm -hmm. filling it in. Uh, it, it starts kind of cryptically, right? I mean, we've got the, Louise, the artist, you know, working out his garden, and at the same time, this activist is climbing a tower to put up a, uh, a slogan and falls to death. And then it's like, well, why? What, what's this about? And you kind of jump away from that and then slowly learn more and more about what the connection is between these, these two characters. Yeah. Uh, did you have this from the get-go, like seven years ago, that you knew this is uh, how these two are going to be linked and that no, that evolved, evolved about that came? That certainly evolved over the course of seven years. And uh, uh, showing Jean an early draft of the, the book and getting her feedback from it and not being a graphic novel fan herself, her, her, her feedback was very valuable in terms of how would someone looking at it very cleanly, clearly, uh, uh, without the prejudice of, of, uh, of being a graphic novel fan, and, and, and giving feedback on the story, constantly on the story. And, and uh, so through that, I was able to, I, it, it, the story it did evolve. So there was definitely a starting point that it did evolve. And that certainly, that opening sequence sets up the theme of, you don't know exactly when our art, how our art will be, Utilized by the public, like we just we're just artists and we create things, songs, um, uh, prose books, uh, graphic books, and we can have intention. But how that in, how that is taken by someone else is is, is a, that's what I tried to indicate with that opening sequence. Is that what Louise, the artist in the book, intended for her sculpture? We don't know exactly. It doesn't really matter. But it's how somebody else. Uh, 
uh, how it influenced them and how they took it. And that is the nature of all of us in terms of making art and how we how we live our lives and not that other. Obviously, as the creator, you have a perspective on what your creation is, whether it's a song, whether it's a sculpture. You mm-hmm. have some sort of message or mm-hmm. some sort of idea, mm-hmm. but you can't control how it's received by others. Mm-hmm. This is the, you know, people who listen to death metal and decide to just burn churches or do other things. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it, does that cause it? Who, you know, blame games and things like that, and mm-hmm. apportioning blame to the artist, and I mean, obviously, I believe gets blamed by several white letter writers throughout the, mm-hmm. the novel. Now, uh, you, you chose to make her a sculptor, and I'm curious in terms of, is, you know, you're the creator, this artist could be any type of artist, she could be a poet, she could, you know, work in, in a digital medium, but you made her a sculptor, which is a very tangible thing, uh, oftentimes larger than life, as we see at the end of the book. Uh, why a sculptor? What was your idea in terms of who was being a sculptor? Well, really, for that, that very reason, is I wanted something that was a, 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 a physical reminder that would stand in a public space. And often, uh, a, a poetry and, and uh, a painting doesn't necessarily sit out in the open. I wanted something that was out in a public space that you didn't have to go to an art gallery, that someone could just walk by and see it. And so I wanted a kind of a piece of art like that because the book is meant to be for all types of people. You don't have to be a graphic novel fan to like this book or to be interested in it. Uh, You don't even have to be a a fan of history because I think it hopefully still communicates in some way outside of a niche. Uh, And that's that's why metaphorically I chose a sculpture because public sculptures are, are open to all without prejudice, I think. You don't need to go into a gallery. You don't need to be a certain kind of person to be moved or not moved by sculpture. Yeah, I mean, obviously, like, if it's a, if it's a public piece, it's it's there. And when you choose to engage with it or not, yes. is your choice. Well, right? There's a certain democracy to it. Yeah, and you've got to have that at the, at the end of the thing. You know, and, uh, it seems kind of flippant where you're like, I don't get it, because one of the characters is walking by her, yeah. and final sculptor. And, 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 you know, it just... Um, it seems like that's okay. That's how people. Some people won't approach it that way, or just will kind of disregard it. And it seems to me like an, almost an artist statement of your own that you know I acknowledge that not everyone mm-hmm. gets where I'm coming from or what I'm trying to get at. Um, mm-hmm. But that you know those who choose to come to it kind of you got it. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's it exactly. And it's acknowledging that. That not, you know, that not everybody gets everything as we intended. Mm-hmm. So, and I mean, there's kind of like an inset what could be the David Lester art, artistic statement throughout the book. And one of the ones I wanted to talk about that I thought might be is that uh, she's, uh, my, even though my ideals remain, I feel like it kind of nostalgia it hurts to see my ideas become unfashionable. That's loneliness. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was curious, I mean, because, you know, you've had a, a long career as an artist and, and you know, Fashions within art kind of come and go and have and flow, mm-hmm. and, and whether you're at the top of it or the bottom of it, in terms of riding some sort of a wave, uh, and whether it comes around, whether it's cyclical, I was curious in terms of what your idea was when you wrote that text. And, well, it comes out again, again of, I, I think, uh, the conversation she and I have had about uh, the nature of longevity. And you realize when we set out to, to start Mecca Normal 25 years ago, we never knew it would last 25 years. We didn't know, we didn't have a, a master plan on how it would turn out. And so, uh, so, so it's only decades later that you can uh, try to comprehend the, the, the uh, idea of longevity. And so that's, that's really where that came from, was realizing if you're an artist, if, if you have passions, you will carry on regardless of how fashions and trends change. And try to avoid the ebb and flow of that by simply uh, continuing to create and continuing to think of your work as vital to yourself and, and the people around you. With the kind of music that Mechanormal set out to make and still perseveres with making, it's, it's somewhat of a, a miracle that anybody ever likes anyway. So that we had some approval and uh, you know, respect and success. Regular terms, 
was, was not our ambition and not our intention. So when it kind of dissipated, we were, of course, in a much better position to return to our actual uh, infrastructure of why we make music. You never got beyond the investments then? No, I mean, it was, I mean, it was a very interesting experience to you know, get a four-star review and go install them into have 500 people at a show and, you know, like, wow, okay, if you say so. But uh, there are always people who have really disliked what we sound like and that we even exist seems to, you know, really drive some people crazy, right? Which has always been part of uh, what fuels us. You know, it's great to get a uh, positive response. Everybody likes that. But as we, we never set out to be entertainers, we, we really set out to change the world. Mm-hmm. And having done that, we now uh, give a lecture on how to, how to do that. On how to change the world. Yeah. The, um, one, of the, one of the things I thought was interesting is that Louise's character, uh, she says she always reads the last chapter first. Mm-hmm. And she, it's, 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 I mean, because there's these like, little episodic uh, encounters, and so she has these conversations with strangers that she meets and, and sort of has intense sort of periods with. And it seems like little throwaway things that she says, but I think they're very revealing about her and I think about larger things. And it, I mean, obviously, when you're reading a book and someone says, I read the last chapter first, it's almost like a, a dare to like skip ahead mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and do just that to read that last chapter first and see where you're going and then go back and see how you got there. Um, I'm one of those methodical people who always reads front to back and, you know, and <laughs> sticks to it. But there was this impulse when it was like, well, is this some sort of dare or like a challenge? Or what was what was the thought in terms of that? <laughs> well, it was, I wasn't daring the reader to, to go to the last chapter, but, but it was a, a metaphorical comment about, again, tying into the theme of the book, which is, 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 is past and present and future. And so the idea of I always read the last chapter first. It's, it's, it's a nudge to the idea that how our futures are are often related to how our pasts are, and 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 how how did the you know how how do they relate and how do they re- reflect each other? And so the person jumping ahead to the future by reading the last chapter mm-hmm. is they want to see how did it how did it turn out? How did how did my present? How is my present going to turn out? How is my past going to inform the future? And so it's it's, it's a, uh, thematically, it's, it's, it's a little, little uh, subtle. Well, I mean, the, 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 the jumping ahead can be kind of a disorienting thing, right? Because you're just presented with the end point, and then it's like, it could be totally random to figure out, okay, what, what, how did I get here? Right? Mm-hmm. Like, it's, it, it could be an end point that you didn't imagine arriving at. And then, like, there, you know, Hitler's Germany, and so like, the end point is, you know, like World War II. If you were to just have that, and then you didn't know that the, the, the like, randomness of him becoming chancellor and stuff, mm-hmm. you wouldn't have thought, okay, if this election's happening, if we go forward from that, this is what we're going to end up with, is, you know, six million Jews mm-hmm. executed, and, mm-hmm. like, a, a travesty of a world war. Is it, in, in a sense, to kind of portray that as well, that this is, you know, it's very disorienting to, to jump ahead and then try to figure out what happened within that. Well, so, certainly, yes, it, it is. And then you, if you jump ahead, you 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 don't want to miss. And that's the whole thing about history: is you 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 have to know certain details in order to understand anything. Um, and 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 that's that, that's exactly what I'm intending there with that. Well, speaking of details, one of the things I thought was interesting was this thing about uh, Hitler's chauffeur and von Lobel. Mm-hmm. Thing, bicycle reflectors. Mm-hmm. Is that something that you just came across when you were doing the research? And you're like, I got to include this. Yes. yes. Well, you know, because uh, Louise is cycling, and I, I wanted to have a mention of of, uh, of a connection to the Nazis and cycling. So that was part of it. I just thought it was a totally bizarre byproduct of, of the Nazi regime. Right. And then the, they made enough money off of it to get Hugo Boss. Uh, Yes, <laughs> even, even more. Well, it, again, it's a tie into the, f- the present with the past, as in terms of fashion, and, and they thought about fashion, and they thought about aesthetics of the uniforms and the SS uniforms. So clearly, they weren't. This wasn't a random regime. This was one that was very mm-hmm. sophisticated and methodical in how they how they presented the art of their 
uh, you know, there's a regime. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, I mean, Hitler being an artist and, you know, wanting to bequeath an art gallery mm-hmm. you know, on his death. Mm-hmm. And, and, I mean, being a failed artist of some repute now, uh, it, uh, it's, it's interesting. I mean, because I've read a couple books on sort of the development of art and propaganda and how the two are linked. And I mean, it certainly looks at Nazi Germany, it looks at Soviet Russia, and, you know, creating this sort of like iconic ubermensch and the, the, the image of Germany as this, you know, pure thing. And then, I mean, you, look, you watch like Triumph of the Will or something. Yes. Where it's artifice and, and the creation of this image that they want to portray, and they did it during the Berlin Olympics. And it's, it was clearly thought out, right? It wasn't random. It wasn't happenstance that they came upon this. They decided this is what we're going to do. We're going to use art. We're going to and specific art, right? Like they banned certain things. And I mean, when you talk about the timeline at the, at the end of the book, you know, one of the first things they do is prevent them from buying books or going to the library and cutting Jews cutting off from art. Yeah, well, we can see then the power that art has. And I think. Uh, as artists, we, we cannot belittle ourselves in, in thinking that it, it, uh, the work we create is, uh, is just is just pretty pictures necessarily, right? And that's good too, but, but uh, clearly how artists have been imprisoned and, and tortured and repressed throughout uh, history, we know art is a very powerful uh, weapon in dealing with uh, injustice and, uh, and uh, civil liberties and, uh, and democracy. So... Uh, Again, this is another reason to to make this book in, in, in the way that I did and the focus that I did have on art within it. Uh, so, so yeah, that's entirely correct. You mentioned the, the, the murder of the, the journalists and that you know, true thing, but you've kind of created these characters you know, from Ray to tell that story. Um, did you sort of synthesize other people that you found in your research, or was this just entirely a creation that, okay, these people worked with this journalist, and I mean, that's how they tell this story, and I remember. Well, I had to research what kind of people lived in this state, and so I just found various families and then what they looked like, and just some ideas around what they might uh, grow up in in that state, and what their political leanings and uh, political level of sophistication would be. So they are entirely made up, but certainly based on on actual research of the individuals of Lipa. Composites of yes, absolutely the actual people. Yeah. Now we talked about the the final statue that Louise makes, and she sketches it while she's talking with uh, with Rudy and, and Marie, and uh, our, there's some, some tragic events in, in their life. And I mean, at first it's kind of it's like, oh, what you're drawing here is like, mm-hmm. you know, hammer and some nails, and why is she sketching this while she talks to them? And then we're presented with this sort of final sculpture that she does, and it's a giant hammer with nails through the handle of the hammer, which, you know, raises the question of where's the other hammer? Like, how did these nails get into mm-hmm. this hammer? Uh, this image and, and this sculpture, I mean, obviously, you close the book with it in a sense. Did that come early, or did that develop over the time? Like, did you have this image in mind, what you wanted to present as her, her, her final piece? Yes, yeah, so absolutely. I had created that uh, image uh, many years even prior to uh, creating the book or having the, the idea for the book. This is it's clearly the idea of the oppressed overtaking the oppressor. And uh, how, how can you physically represent that without using fists and people's people as a, as a, you know, how can you represent that visually mm-hmm. without using people? So that's what I tried to do with that. And it's sort of an abstract as well. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it, it does raise that question. I mean, it, it, it does speak to power in some way, because obviously mm-hmm. hammer has been you know, used to symbolize power in, in some way. Uh, and, and nails get you know, driven into the hands of Jesus and, yes, you know, yeah. I mean, it's, it's got biblical overtones. Um, but also you don't want to, uh, you know, I didn't want to represent a type of person, you know, a physical person on the planet, so I wanted it to be uh, universally uh, applicable. Right, and then the hammer is a fairly, like, simple tool that people yes, are coming to it, right? I mean, yeah. yeah. And it's brutal in its own sort of way, and which uh, I thought represented tyrants. You know, there's a banality and a brutality to 
to uh, a mundaneness to to uh, many uh, tyrants that you can find in anywhere. Yeah, they can come out from anywhere. And again, tying in with where did Hitler come from? He's just some, you know, schmuck from Austria, right? So, but look what happened. Yeah. So again, cautionary tale. And I mean, it's, it, you know, it's a tool, right? I mean, using tools for aims of power and things like that. I mean, it kind of speaks to that as well. Mm-hmm. It's a pretty interesting uh, final image. Um, you're launching this book tonight at Mondrian. I mean, we should talk details of that so people can come out and check it out. Yes, well, this is, uh, this is again, an interesting thing about working with Gene and over, over this, this period of time and being collaborators is, is that I made this book and then Gene has created what we call an adaptation of the book for us to present as as individuals and as mechanormal. So uh, it's interesting how that can work, how, how our work can, can morph into other 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 ways, like from a book to a, a, a play to a, a stage performance. And so this is what's, uh, what we're going to do tonight. And we also include a uh, PowerPoint presentation of the of a lot of images from from the book. So people will get to see the artwork uh, behind us, and um, and that ties in with what we're doing in terms of what we're talking about and what how we will be performing uh, songs. And so, yeah, it's a, it actually should it's we can actually enjoy it. We just did it uh, last week at the University of British Columbia, and it was uh, it was really fun to to do in front of this big class. And you know, we we, we were like thrilled about it. We, were, we enjoyed it. It's a two-hour creative writing class. Was our presentation in Vancouver before we hit the road. Winnipeg being our first stop really on the tour, and uh, strangely enough, we have not been to play. Mackinac has not played in Winnipeg since 1987, and we're really hoping to, you know, catch up a bit tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and and we we will come again soon if if it all goes well. Uh, so hoping a lot of people will come out tonight and hear Mackinac and uh, really to take David's book in their hands and. After this great conversation you guys have generated here to open the pages. And well, I was going to say, we've talked all about the ideas and we heard, we've talked about the images. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Quite honest. And then but tonight, maybe that's yeah, the idea. It tempted, it tempted, right. it tempted your audience. Mm-hmm. So, in terms of this, this performance that you've created, like, what, when, when you said, okay, let's, let's do a performance. Oh, yeah, so you're saying, okay, let's do a performance. Oh, you, you, okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 My main contribution to David's book is leaving him alone, you know, for seven years and recognizing that he was working on that. And because Mechanormal is such a long-term vehicle for both of our creative projects to fit within, that we, I write novels, I've two published novels, I've written three other novels that I'm looking for a literary agent for. And Dave has been my publisher of one of those novels, the published ones. So, you know, we, we take each other's solo endeavors very seriously, and then our art form becomes a collaboration in promotion and facilitating a public m- method of getting those items, whether they're books or paintings or posters, around in front of people. And we're, that's where Mechanormal is, is uh, both use, useful to us, and we get to kind of include that. So when you're in a classroom, whether it's a high school, a university, or an art school, and you're there to give a lecture, and you're sort of pretty much everybody's, you know, mom and dad's age, and uh, suddenly you're playing punk rock guitar in the middle of your lecture and talking about, you know, our origins in, in the Pacific Northwest and the grunge scene and Nirvana and Kay, and suddenly you're like, what the hell? Are, who, who are these people? And it's a so, little lecture about art. <laughs> yeah, so it, it kind of would tie that in to to create something that they, they wouldn't normally get in the classroom. And we're civilians, we're not academics, but we're in there talking about our excursion through the last 25 years and that, you know, if they gave it a chance, they too could have interesting lives if they set aside their, their goal for fame and fortune and consider the long history of how art can actually create and has created progressive social change and the great value to that and just the way that life can be a tremendous adventure in meeting people all over the place and collaborating to make the world. I know it sounds corny to make how to make the world a better place, how to change the world. Entirely possible. Talking about art and progressive social change, kind of hints at maybe why you ended up on Urban Arena. 
Well, I had done a, a previous book with them, The Grisly Arts of Capitalism, and I, I didn't know that they would be interested in a graphic novel because they hadn't. This is their first, uh, the first one that they published, and uh, and they did send it out to a number of publishers, but they were the first one uh, to respond uh, very quickly and very excitedly. So. Uh, you know, I thought, wow, how appropriate. You know, like, I, I love the books that they do, and they did my last book. So if they're actually really excited about this, this is, this is perfect, right? So, so it seemed a, a natural thing to do at that point. And I thought they did a great job of making, you know, the, the, the printing job was excellent. And, you know, I was very happy with it and the paper and everything. So, so yeah, this worked out very well. And, and also to be in some, uh, a publisher that you, you do admire the kind of work that they do uh, for the past 15 years. So uh, that's something to be in each label where the rest of the acts are. Exactly. And I think, you know, Gene and I have often been on labels where we, we feel some relationship to other artists on there. And I don't think you get that with every publisher or every record label uh, to feel a connection with other people on the label or the person who runs the label, etc. right? So your listeners know that they are a Winnipeg-based mm-hmm. publishing endeavor. So that, that is sort of specifically what, what brings us here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now the launch there, what time is that? Mm-hmm. Um, we'll start at 7.30. And uh, we'll certainly be playing <coughs> uh, 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 quite a few uh, mechanomal songs that have not been recorded yet. So that's hopefully a treat for people to hear songs that are, you know, before they are permanently stamped into, into the world. And uh, so that's exciting for us to, to be playing uh, playing our art, that is, it's very fluid and uh, it has a specialist uh, to playing it live. There's a, there's a lot of flexibility and creativity in how we perform these ones, which wouldn't be quite the same when we do record them. So, so each performance on this tour is, is going to be a little bit different in that way. Are, are you saying that once you record something, you know, almost have to stick to the script with it? Well, the recording will be, it's hard to, to describe exactly, but there is a there is a, also again the relationship of Gene and I performing the song very comfortable, and we can be very fluid with the song. So Gene wants to, you know, talk about a certain thing, then um, we're we're able to accommodate that, and it it, it it takes on the life of the room to a certain extent as well, mm-hmm. which you don't have when you just you simply record it and without an audience there and that sort of feedback. With these unreleased songs, do you kind of road test them to see which ones work and which ones don't, or are you just going to work like you? How do you feel about it? It, it? Not really, no. We're not that consumed by what people sitting in front of us respond. Think about us too much. Uh, yeah, I'm just curious. Because some bands really kind of like, before they hit the road with some of these songs, kind of say, oh, what, what will work, what won't work. And then we'll kind of like, shape our record around that. Sounds like you're a good idea. Well, we, we create a set for different reasons, I think. You know, to create a balance tonight to the adaptation, it, it, it almost requires, you know, Dave is, is very history oriented, so we explore within the adaptation history versus story. History being male and story being female. So Marie ends up talking a lot to Louise on the level of personalities and emotions and their regret. And Rudolph ends up going on and on about history, as we want to do. So there's a little bit of tension there between Rudolph and Marie. And that same tension exists between Mac and Normal. You know, we, we share a stage. I'm not in the center, and Dave's not my backup guitar player. Right, Yes, and it's the male and the female together. We're not a romantic item. We have been doing this a long time, and it's difficult to keep it together. Just, you know, financially, we don't really make enough money to to continue that isn't our motivation. I work currently my EI and I apparently shouldn't say that, but uh, <laughs> flying around the country. But uh, I, I work one day a week at Curves, gym for women. So it's actually very hard to orchestrate a life being very frugal on a single person doing the online dating. Yeah, and it's just like hanging on that this is the, the very life that I have chosen and protect and I protect my solitude really so that I can remain a creative individual without, you know, the sort of negative aspects of being in a romantic partnership which can be draining. And I mean, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, 
I'm available. But I haven't <laughs> stuck doing this crisis ridden online dating. But, uh, you know, I was just expressing that, that there is tension within that normal, and it oftentimes manifests in each song whether we can hear each other well enough or hear ourselves well enough or, you know, and the audience witnesses really the creation of art every time we play these songs. So that's, you know, people have often said that we're, you know, we're a really great live band, even though we have one guitar and one vocalist. And I think oftentimes you wouldn't guess that to, to just listen to our CDs. You know, you wouldn't know how we would take over a stage or whatever. It reminds me of the time I'm playing in Paris many years ago where we, we needed two chairs and they were the promoters were all in the what's happening here and they were we found out later that they thought we were going to sit down because we were, we were probably in our forties at that point, right? Maybe late thirties, so they thought we were going to have to sit down and we found out later that they were really worried about that, that it wasn't a sit down kind of show. Anyway, Dave just needed it for his hand and I needed some place to put my three hundred beers or whatever on that. <laughs> 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 Yeah, so there are old, old people in their 30s, again. anyway, now we're in our 50s, so, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm still very cognizant of what you're doing. Yeah, well, I could have been 10 years ago, so I'm, I'm way more cognizant. I didn't even say cognizant, so well after you. <laughs> <laughs>